Hello class, today we'll be looking at Chapter 5, Ethernet. We have a lot to cover in this chapter. We'll be looking at the operation of the Ethernet protocol and how the frame fields and all of that work together to create the world's most popular LAN protocol. We'll finish up by looking at a Layer 3 switch. Ethernet is capable of working on shared media, contention-based uh, technologies, full bandwidth, like full duplex technologies. Um, more to be said on that as we move through here, but contention-based simply means uh, that you just take advantage of empty space, much like how we drive on the road. So if you were to pull out of your driveway, you would just look, and if there was an opening to pull out, you would go ahead and pull out. That's called contention base. We all contend for the same shared resources. A turn based would be where you had a definite turn and you waited your turn, much like maybe at an on-ramp to a freeway where they may have a green and red light and you just have to wait for the light to go green and then you know it's your turn. Let's look at the Ethernet protocol. Most widely used LAN protocol today operates at layer two and layer one of the OSI model. It's uh, in a family of network protocols defined by two numbers, 8022 and 8023 standards. Uh, additionally, we, we have another standard we're not really gonna talk about specifically in this chapter, 80211, which is our wireless ethernet. But we're specifically talking today mostly about 8022 and 8023, although we will touch on wireless. It supports almost any bandwidth from the beginning at 10 megabits per second all the way up to you know, 30, 40, and 100 megabits um, or 100 gigabits, sorry, today. So uh, any speed that is out there and they're hitting higher speeds all the time. Ethernet defines, of course, the OSI layer two and layer one technologies. And as you may have already figured out, the OSI model, the seven layers are also broken down into various sub layers. And if this is a chapter where we will be looking at two of those, the data link layer is split into two sublayers. The upper half of the data link layer we call the LLC or logical link control sublayer and the lower half is called the MAC sublayer where the MAC address resides. Here's a graphical look at that. Here's the seven layers of the OSI model with the bottom two layers and you can see how the data link layer is split in half. A good way to think about this is if you think about a physical network interface card uh, say a PCI card that we, you would purchase and take out of a box and install in a computer, that card would exist at the physical layer and the lower half of the data link layer. And then the upper half of the data link layer, the LLC would be the driver that came with that on a CD or a download. That would be the driver that allows that physical card to talk to a particular operating system. So if you wanted to install that uh, physical card in another computer with a different operating system, say going from Windows 7 to Windows 8 to Windows 10, all you would need is a different driver. And so it speeds the evolution of, um, of network technologies by having this structure. So 8022 literally has the job of communicating between the physical hardware to the software layers. And layers three and above are entirely in software and layer one is entirely physical. It's just really the wires and the transceiver that puts um, bits on and off of those wires. So layer two is really a special layer in that it is the bridge between the physical hardware-based world and the software-based one. So as I said, this is just a, a look at that same thing. There's an error in this diagram from Cisco. This is a stock Cisco PowerPoint. And I'm gonna fix it for you. See what I'm doing is the physical layer only goes up through the physical medium and the physical signaling sublayer. Yes, the physical layer is also split in half. You have the physical medium, which would actually be the copper wire, the fiber optic wire, the um, the wireless, and then the signaling sublayer is the transceiver. A transceiver sends and receives the send and receive um, thing. But for this chapter, we're looking at the two sublayers of the data link layer. That would be the LLC and the MAC. 
And you can see if you wanted to go to a different physical media, say you wanted to switch from coax to twisted pair copper or go to fiber optic, you would only be changing out the physical nick, which is um, in that orange highlighted square there. So it speeds the evolution of new network technologies by breaking them down into the various layers. So data encapsulation, this is the MAC sublayer. This is where the MAC address lives. So sometimes called the physical address or the burned in address is that 48 bit binary number that is unique to every ethernet port on every device. So each port has its own MAC address. And so when you move your computer from your home to your work to school, it keeps the same MAC address everywhere it goes, but its layer three logical address, its IP address changes at each of those locations. So the MAC address is kind of a forever address and it uh, goes away when you buy a new NIC. If you remove that network card and put a different one in, you would get a different MAC address. Also the NIC, the network card will provide um, cyclical redundancy check, that's an error check and that's done entirely in hardware. There's a special chip on the network card that will compute um, the number of bits in the frame and then it will run them through a simple calculation called the CRC and it will come up with a number and it will check that result against the CRC value provided in the frame and if the two match you know the frame has arrived without error. And if they don't match, it means some of the bits have changed since when it was calculated at the, at the beginning and when you're recalculating it now. So those are um, some primary functions of the MAC sublayer. We'll look a lot at CSMA technology in the next few slides. CSMA is used to detect collisions. So like I analogized earlier, if you wanted to pull out of your parking lot onto the road and drive to school, you would look both ways and then go for it if the coast was clear, so to speak. So that's really what CSMA tells the computer to do before it starts sending bits on the wire, is to listen to the wire and verify that there's no one else sending bits at the same time. So we have two flavors of CSMA. We have CSMA CD, which is used on our ethernet wired networks, so used on fiber optic and copper networks. And we have CSMA CA, stands for collision avoidance, which is used on wireless networks. So on the faster wired networks, we use collision detection, which simply means that if you're using CSMA CD as a machine, it means you're listening to the wire as you're speaking. So as you're sending bits, your ears are listening to the wire. And if you hear someone else speaking, you know there's been a collision and you go into a back off algorithm that determines when and how you, you try to speak again. And we sometimes do this as human beings when we're having a conversation. If I were speaking with you right now and you started talking, I, my ears would detect that and say, gee, I'm speaking and you're speaking. And that would be interpreted by us as a collision. That's exactly what CSMA CD does. We're not gonna really talk a lot about CSMA CA because we have a different chapter later on on wireless in another class. But CA is collision avoidance. Essentially, it tries to avoid collisions. There's a consequence for this. In a wireless network, let's say you had 54 megabit per second connection on your wireless, you're going to lose up to half of it for what they call management, which is managing those uh, collision avoidances. And so it, it consumes quite a bit of bandwidth and mains, makes for a slower connection when you try to avoid collisions. So one of the two common methods of ethernet are CSMA CD. The other is CSMA CA for collision avoidance, used specifically by wireless networks. Should mention that either of these methods are only used on half duplex networks. And so if the wire supports sending and receiving at the same time, and when we start talking about switches, that's exactly what switches do for us. Each port on a switch is full duplex and allows a device to send and receive simultaneously. 
Let me give you some analogies. If you've heard of a CB radio, on a CB it's half duplex. You can only send or receive. You can't send and receive. A telephone, if you're using your cell phone, you can send and receive. You could talk while you're listening. Has to be with the same person, so it's not a perfect analogy because a computer can be talking to one device while listening to another. But human beings are only half duplex, so even though our phones support full duplex communication, we typically only use them in half duplex because we don't like others talking while we're also talking. But computers don't mind that at all, so they have no problem listening to bits as they're coming in while they're simultaneously sending bits out. This will make your communications a lot faster to have full duplex. Well, obviously, you wouldn't need collision detection or collision avoidance because you wouldn't be, you're on a two-lane road and you wouldn't be having those collisions. So we'd be collision-free. But on a half duplex where collisions exist, we need to use one of these two. Your network card will first detect whether it's half or full duplex. And if it's half duplex, it will implement one of these two uh, methods depending if it's wired or wireless. Let's talk about that MAC address. The Ethernet requires a MAC address from each device connected to it, so every sender and receiver on an Ethernet network will have to have a MAC address on every Ethernet port. The MAC address is broken into two sections. The first 24 bits are assigned by IANA to the manufacturer, someone like Apple, Intel, Microsoft, and the remaining 24 bits is up to that vendor, to that company like Apple, Microsoft, Intel to make up. And so you could think of the last 24, the vendor assigned as a serial number of sorts. And so they typically just roll them one, two, three, four, that kind of thing. And the first 24 bits would all be the same. So if I were to go out and buy two Microsoft Surface 3 um, tablets right now, and I looked at the MAC addresses, the first 24 bits would be identical because those would track back to the manufacturer, Microsoft. The remaining 24 bits would have to be different. They might not be very different because if they were manufactured very close together, there may only be a couple bits different, but they will be different. They will be unique and can operate on the same network. Every hexadecimal MAC address has to be unique in some way uh, within a network so that it can uniquely identify that one device out of all the devices in that network. Here's some examples of MAC addresses. Notice that they can be listed with dashes as separators, colons as separators, or even dots. And you don't even have to have the separator after every two hexadecimal symbols. You could have it after every three or every four. There's really no requirement with a separator like we do have with IP. IPv4 requires a dot. IPv6 requires a colon and they specify at how many bit intervals those are placed. We don't really have that with MAC addresses. It's really just a 48 bit uh, binary number that's in two parts. And the separators are there just for human beings' eyes to help them uh, kind of read, read out the address. And this talks about how a frame is processed by your network card and how when an incoming frame comes, it looks at the destination field and reads the MAC address. And if it doesn't match its own MAC address, it's going to discard the frame. And in that way, it never passes it up the OSI layer if it's not intended for it and doesn't waste any of your um, operating system, CPU, or RAM resources because all this is done by the specialty chips on the network card. Let's take a look at those Ethernet frames. Well, Ethernet historically started in the Hawaiian Islands at the University of Hawaii in Honolulu, and it was called Aloha Net, and it was used as a wireless transmission uh, radio signal between the islands to send uh, computer information. This was uh, probably never going to be discovered had um, IBM not tried to push a competing technology called Token Ring on the world. And their competitors, DEC and Intel and others, said, wow, we need to have something that competes with IBM Token Ring. And they went shopping and bought this from the University of Hawaii. And so you'll see below, Ethernet 2 is what they purchased and first released. Once it became an international standard, you'll see it above, is the new current Ethernet 8023 that we use today. 
They are backwards compatible, so a modern network card can talk to an old Ethernet 2 card on an original DEC um, alpha system. So you've got the ability to interconnect Ethernet from way, way back to the modern world. And I'll show you why that is. As we look at the two frames, the computer can quickly discern whether it's a new 8023 frame or the older Ethernet 2. Notice the old Ethernet 2 frame has an 8-byte preamble. The preamble is simply a alternating 101010 for 8 bytes. It's similar to the bugle um, at a, a military camp, a wake-up bugler or your alarm clock going ee, 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 ee. It doesn't itself contain any useful information, so that whole preamble is just a um, 101010010 and it's ignored. It's simply to get the attention of the receiving device. What they did to help discern that it was a newer 8023 frame is they took the last byte of the preamble and inverted the bit order. So you'd have seven bytes of 101010 and that eighth byte would be 010101. That is called the start frame delimiter. If that is there, so notice they just split the preamble, the eight byte preamble got split into a seven byte preamble and a one byte start frame delimiter. So if the receiving device detects a start frame delimiter, it knows it's an 8023 frame. The only difference between the two frames is they repurposed the type field. If you look at that two byte field at the bottom that says type, which would have uh, had a type code in it, like a hexadecimal 800 for, um, for Ethernet, I'm sorry, for IPv4, uh, would have said there's an IP packet inside of here. So in a modern 8023 frame, you could also put the length of the the length. So on an 8023 frame, you could put the length. Uh, you can actually still put the type. So it's even if you are using a modern 8023 frame, you can use a length or a type. You can put either one in there because actually all the type codes are higher than the maximum length of an Ethernet frame. So there's uh, very easy for the computer to discern whether you put a type or a length in there. So great compatibility between the two. Don't really have to work, worry about the differences. Now there's a minimum and a maximum frame size. So the minimum frame size is 64 bytes. You can't send an ethernet frame that's say 63 bytes long. So you'd have to add some padding if you uh, didn't have enough data to send. You've got your ethernet header, you've got your trailer, you've got the data field. And if you don't have enough data plus the headers to equal 64 bytes, you'll have to put what they call padding, which is meaningless ones and zeros that just pad out the size of the Ethernet frame. If you have a frame that is not 64 bytes, it's considered illegal and thrown away. The frame uh, typically has a special name called a runt. And that's just a frame that's too small to legally travel on the wire. The maximum Ethernet frame used to be 1518 bytes, 1518 bytes. Uh, that's no longer true. You're going to see in a future slide that's been raised to 1522. So a current maximum for Ethernet frames is 1522. Anything larger is called a giant. Here's why it's 1522. We added a new field called the VLAN tag. Notice the extra four bytes. So if you take 1518 and add four to it, you get 1522. So on VLAN capable networks and VLAN capable network cards, they support up to 1522 as a maximum frame size. To be compatible with older devices that only support 1518, the switch will remove this extra frame field before sending the frame out those ports, shrinking the frame back down to the maximum 1518. So here are the key fields. This is the entire Ethernet frame header that we are looking at here. And notice you have the preamble, the start frame delimiter, so we know this is an 8023 frame and not an Ethernet 2 frame because of the SFD. We have a destination and source address. Notice the destination address is listed first, allowing the frame to be switched and forwarded quicker. Who it's to. The length field, which is also um, acceptable with type, and you can see that below, it could be length type. Normally it's written as length slash type. You could put either in there. 
but you can't put both. You can put one or the other. And then you put your data, however much data you want to cram in up to the maximum. And if you can't put the minimum, say you only have eight bytes of data, then you'll have to put, you know, 40 uh, or 38 bytes of padding in there. You have to pad it out to the minimum length. And then we have that trailer, which is the frame check sequence and error checking field, which adds up the other fields and computes a value based on the bits in them. And then when it arrives at the destination, that value is recomputed and checked against the original value. And if they don't match, the frame is said to be aired or invalid and thrown away. So you'll often see it written either way, either an FCS, frame check sequence, that's the name of the field, or CRC, which is the name of the calculation. So a CRC, or cyclical redundancy check, is the formula used to create, it's the number, and the field itself is called a frame check sequence. Here's a throwback to our Intech 103 IP subnetting class. Notice uh, we're just looking at how a MAC address is written in hexadecimal and how that can be converted to binary or decimal. Here's a look at what a MAC address would look like in a Windows PC if you were to type the ipconfig all command. Now this command, you have to actually put a space. They made an error in this slide. After ipconfig, you have to put a space slash all, or you could also put a dash all. And you'll notice that Windows is using a dash separator between every octet. It is also appropriate to use colons, and many Unix systems will use colons. And the Cisco routers and switches often like to use the period. All three are acceptable. A MAC address can be one of three types. It can be unicast, multicast, or broadcast. This is a unicast MAC. The unicast MAC would be the burned in or physical MAC address. And typically when you're sending a unicast um, message, say from one IP address to another, you would use a unicast MAC from one device to another. There's also a broadcast MAC, it's FFFFF, and it's typically used when we're sending a layer three broadcast. So if you were sending an IP broadcast, it would typically go in a frame that had a layer two broadcast. So our layer two broadcast is FFFFFF, which is just 48 ones. So all ones is a broadcast, kind of the same rule that we had with IP addressing is the host bits are all ones, it's a broadcast. So in a MAC address, if all the bits are ones, it's a broadcast. Then we have a third type, multicast. So if we're using a multicast IP address, here's a multicast IPv4 address, 224.0.0.1. And what we would do then is combine that with a unicast address to create. So we combine basically, we combine that IPv4 address, the binary bits, we slam those into the uh, MAC address and it creates a custom multicast address. And that's what this is talking about here. We're not specifically going to really deal with multicast in this class. You just have to be aware that you can create multicast MAC addresses to complement the multicast IP addresses. Okay, a MAC address is physical. The address does not change. It is locked into the device. An IP address is logical. It can be changed. It can be grouped. It can be regrouped. End-to-end -end connectivity is done with the combination of a source and destination MAC address and a source and destination IP. The IP addresses are global. They identify who it's really from and who it's really to. That's not always the case with the MAC addresses. They're the local delivery addresses. So they're only going to be the actual source and destination if those two devices exist on the same network um, area. And so if they're in the same broadcast domain, the MAC addresses will match up from the source and destination. If, however, you're trying to reach a remote destination on the other side of a router, the MAC address will deliver your frame from you to the router, even though your IP addresses are from you to the remote destination. 
You may use very different protocols at layer two to get a message around the world. We would use an IP address. In this case, I have a PC called Paris and a PC called Japan. If they had IP addresses, I would use the IP address from Paris to Japan in the packet. In the frame though, it would be from Paris to my router, then a different frame from my router to my satellite dish, and a different frame from satellite dish to satellite and from satellite to dish, and then yet yeah, a different frame to the wireless router in Japan, and then another different frame from the wireless router to the PC Japan. So we would use a lot of different frames. We typically router to router tear the frame off and put a brand new frame on on each leg of the journey. But the packet with the IP addressing remains intact and we only use one of those from end to end, making it a global addressing. Okay, we have a special protocol called Address Resolution Protocol. This is a protocol that helps us find a MAC address when we know the IP address. Working down the OSI, we might start with a um, URL, maybe yahoo.com, and we would use DNS to turn that into an IP address. We use ARP to turn the IP address into a MAC address. ARP works by sending a broadcast of that IP address out on the network to everyone and saying, hey, who has this IP address? I need to know your MAC. And then an ARP reply is received back, which says, hey, I, I'm that IP address. Here is my MAC address. Send it to me. And that's essentially how that works. The ARP protocol is responsible for sending and receiving those requests and replies and also maintaining a table of the mappings between known IP addresses and the learned MAC addresses. Here is an example. In the ARP table, again, we're going to keep track of the known IP addresses and the learned MAC address equivalents. An ARP request is always a broadcast. And so it is sent to all devices, but it is non-routable, so it never goes beyond the router. Here's an uh, example that we'll actually look at because we've got the little arrows copied from the online curriculum for you. Host A wants to reach host D. So it sends out an ARP request. Notice this is a broadcast received by the router and hosts B, C, and D. Notice it receives a reply. And the reply notice is a unicast. Host A in its ARP table was now able to match up the IP address to the corresponding MAC address. And there goes the frame with the data that we wanted to send. So that's how the ARP protocol helps enable the device to actually send the messages. If you're trying to reach a remote device, the router will reply on behalf. And so you'll send the ARP broadcast and the router will say, hey, use my MAC address. So the ARP request goes out and says, who has the um, IP address of yahoo.com? I need your MAC. And that will never get to Yahoo. So your router says, hey, I recognize that that IP address is off net somewhere else. And the router replies back and says, here's the MAC address to use. And so your ARP table would put the router's MAC address correlated to the IP address for Yahoo. Meaning every time you try to reach Yahoo in the frame, you would actually send the message to your router. ARP also has a timer that automatically removes entries when they haven't been used for a period of time. So if you haven't been sending any more messages to host C, ARP will automatically remove that entry after about two minutes. If you want, there are commands, ARP commands from the Windows command line and the Cisco command line to manually remove or add entries to the ARP table. Here's how you can look at the ARP table on a Cisco device and a Windows PC. Here's how ARP can create problems. ARP uses broadcasts. Too many broadcasts use up the bandwidth and they generate a lot of CPU 
utilization as devices have to read the ARP request at layer three, because remember the broadcast has an IP address in it and not a MAC address. So a broadcast MAC address is FFFF. It has to be received and read by all devices. And layer three is in the operating system consuming CPU and RAM. So we're consuming CPU, RAM, and bandwidth of every device on this network every time we send an ARP request. So too many, and we can have issues. Also, there's the security issue that you're sending this broadcast to all devices, and you're expecting only the legitimate device to reply back and say, yeah, that's me. A hacker could exploit that and reply and say, oh, no, actually, that's me. No, actually, that's me too. And it could actually populate your ARP table with its own MAC address so it could dupe your device into sending frames that should have gone to other devices to the hacker. So one way we can mitigate ARP issues is by segmenting our network so that we put less devices in smaller areas and groupings so that we can better control broadcasts. Okay, let's look at switch ports on a layer two switch. So you plug in a bunch of devices to a layer two switch and they automatically find each other. The way that happens is the switch takes a frame that comes into it from a device and it looks up the destination MAC address in a table it maintains called the MAC address table, sometimes called the CAM table. The MAC address or CAM table is the table that tells the switch what MAC addresses are on what physical ports of the switch. If it's never talked to that device before, the switch doesn't know where the MAC address is and it would flood your frame out all ports and send a copy to all devices. But as soon as the device you were trying to reach replies back, the frame will see that and it will add that MAC address to the MAC address table for the port that it came in on and subsequent messages to that device will be able to move directly through the switch fast and only out the port intended. Here's that written out for you. Notice that every time you send information, the switch records your source MAC address in its address table for the port. So PC1 on port one has just been entered into the CAM or MAC address table for port one. So port one the switch now knows the MAC address of PC1. Why? Because PC1 sent a message and the message would have from information that has now been recorded. Right? Once it got flooded, out ports two and three, the next time PC1 tries to communicate with PC2, it is no longer flooded because the switch now knows the MAC address of both PC1 and PC2 simply because they've communicated before. So the switch learns and it gets better with time and it floods fewer and fewer frames and knows where they go more and more. So as the switch operates longer um, and devices communicate longer, the switch gets more efficient at switching. A switch also will be able to run in either a half duplex or full duplex mode on a port by port basis. So if you plugged a hub or wireless access point that we know are half duplex and you plug one into a switch, it would switch to half duplex mode on that one port and turn on CSMA CD and start listening for collisions. If you plugged a, another switch or a PC or some device, almost all devices today that are full duplex, the switch would detect that and disable CSMA CD and follow full duplex rules, doubling your bandwidth. Switches also support auto MDIX on gigabit ports. They may also support it on 10 and 100 megabit ports, but it was an optional feature that may or may not be supported depending on your switch model. But if the ports are gigabit ethernet, you can safely use a straight through ethernet cable for everything. So if these were all gig ports, I would use a straight through cable in all four or five examples shown here. 
If, however, it was 10 and 100 ports, I would have to use the correct cabling. And so for the top, switch to switch, and the bottom, router to PC, those are both like devices, and you would have to use a crossover cable because there'd be no auto MDIX. Auto MDIX, or just MDIX or AutoDIX, would automatically in software rewire the cable as needed. So it's a cool feature that allows us to essentially eliminate a crossover cable and use nothing but straight through cabling. Let's talk about two different ways we can forward frames. So the standard default way is called store and forward where an incoming frame is recorded in a buffer which is just RAM. And so all the bits come in and they're all stored in this buffer until they all arrive and the frame is done. And then we would compute a cyclical redundancy check, the frame check sequence in that trailer field of the frame and verify that the frame is valid and we've received all the bits correctly. We would then, as the switch, look up the destination MAC address in our address table and then forward it out one or all ports depending on whether we found it. That's the normal operation, but we can do it quicker. Switches can use cut-through switching. You can turn this on on a port-by-port -port basis, and it allows the switch to start sending the bits out the outgoing port while they're still arriving on the incoming port. So as soon as enough bits have arrived that I can read the destination MAC address, I look it up in my address table and can start forwarding those bits out the outgoing port they're going to while the remainder of the frame has not yet even arrived. This is obviously much faster, but there are two consequences. One is it only works when the egress and ingress port, the port the bits are coming into the switch on and the port the bits are going out, are the same speed. So if the ports are 10 megabit and 10 megabit, then it will use cut through. But even if you've told it to use cut through switching, if the speeds are different, it will revert to store and forward because you can't have the bits arriving at a different speed than they're going out. It just wouldn't be synchronized. The other consequence is you can't compute the CRC check. There's no way to do that because it's at the end of the frame and by the time you get to the end of the frame you would already have sent all the bits out the other port so even if there was an error it would be too late to throw that frame away. We've got two varieties of cut through switching. One is called fast forward which is the fastest way to go. The other is called fragment free which is a little slower. It tells the switch to listen to the first 64 bytes of the frame before it starts forwarding them out the outgoing port. What this ensures is that we have no runs, no illegally small frames. So we wait because 64 bytes is the shortest length of a valid Ethernet frame. And it says, you know, let's just listen to a few bytes longer and make sure that we have at least it's a, a valid length of an Ethernet frame. Because if it is a frame that's been damaged, often it doesn't have the full 64 bytes. It's just the front, the front part. Because like in the real world, most collisions are head on. And so if there's been a collision, it typically ha happens near the front of the vehicle. And so uh, in this case, the vehicle being the frame. And so you may have only a very few bits moving down the wire where the remaining bits got damaged or lost in the past. Uh, wire fell out, a lot of things can happen that cause the um, remaining bits in the frame to disappear. So that's a nice happy medium that you can sometimes select. Again, these have to be selected or configured manually by the administrator on a port by port basis. Two types of memory available on switches. Port based memory is separate little RAM chips on every single port. You have some RAM chips for incoming and some RAM chips for outgoing. And uh, shared memory is one giant area memory shared by all ports for all their incoming and outgoing. Power over Ethernet. This is a feature that you can purchase with switches that sends electrical current down the Ethernet cable to devices that need it, like a phone or a wireless access point, or even a small laptop. Another thing with switches is what type to get. The fixed configuration switches are your cheapest, and what you see is what you get. If you buy it with 24 copper Ethernet ports, that's all you have, and if you want to add a 25th later, you have to buy a whole new switch. 
or if you say wanted to swap one of those copper ports out for a fiber optic port. Too bad, have to buy a new switch. That's fixed configuration, but you save a lot of money up front, but there's no expandability. A modular configuration switch allows you to pull the ports in and out and replace them typically in cards. So not necessarily a single port, but sometimes. So we have um, single port modularity, and we'll look at that in the, in the next slide here, but we also have cards where I can expand and add additional uh, ports to the switch of either copper or even wireless, wireless, copper, you know, fiber optic. optic. So that gives me, um, and some of the big ones, you can even upgrade the CPU and the RAM. So a lot of uh, modular switches, uh, you can add more power supplies. They're, they're extremely modular. Uh, they cost a lot more up front, however. And at the bottom, you'll see stackable configuration switches. This is a neat feature, but it's an expensive one. And it allows you to take a whole stack of your switches and cable them together with a special stacking cable. And the switches operate or act like they're one giant switch. So that's pretty neat. And you can do that with fixed configuration or modular switches, but you have to buy the switch with the feature up front. And that's about $1,000 per switch on a Cisco switch to add that feature. They also require those special stacking cables, which are proprietary and they cost about $45 a cable. And you'll see uh, the top switch, switch one cable to the lower switch two, and then switch two to three and three to four. And then switch four is back up to switch one, creating a loop. Here are those replaceable, upgradable modular ports. We have the ability called an SFP or small form factor port to pull out a modular port, say a copper port and replace it with a fiber port or different um, types of port configuration options. Now we'll compare layer two and layer three switching. You can buy a switch with a little mini me router baked right in. So on the left, you can see what it would look like in a classic switch router scenario where you have a standalone router cabled to a layer two LAN switch. Then on the right, what it's like when you have a layer three switch that has the router baked in. Cisco has a cool technology for switches um, that is layer three switching and in routers and it's called CEPH or Cisco Express Forwarding. And all this does is speed up switching. It can be done in hardware or software. So some switches have CEPH in hardware where it's really fast and some uh, do it in software where it's not as fast. Essentially, what Ceph is, is like when you make a shortcut on the desktop to a file or folder that you may use frequently. Maybe you've clicked down and used that file all the time and you decide, hey, I'm going to throw a shortcut on the desktop so I can get there quicker. That's what Ceph is essentially doing. It's keeping some special tables that allow it to um, tell if you've switched or routed, switch routed that way before, and it allows it to shortcut and not go through the routing table um, and, and go quicker. So it just speeds things up. All right, some types of layer three interfaces. And actually I should point out that layer two switches support SBI and ether channel. So really only the routed port is unique to a layer three switch. So an SBI is just a logical interface we call a VLAN. And a routed port would be a port that we put an IP address on. When you put an IP address on a port, and you have it behave like a router and it's connected to a routing protocol and a routing table. It essentially, that's what makes a layer three switch a layer three switch, is we can take any port and any number of ports and turn them into router ports as we need. And the other ports would remain layer two switch ports. So a layer three switch doesn't mean it's layer two or layer three. We can actually turn on and off layer two and three in a port by port basis. And then ether channel is a logical bundle of ports. So if I took two switches and put three physical cables between them, say I physically cabled three gig ethernet ports between two switches, if I assign them to the same ether channel, you would get an effective three gigabits of throughput on that bundle of ports. Here's how to configure a routed port on a layer three switch. You have a lab doing this, so I won't spend a lot of time. You can do this in packet tracer. All we're doing is the command no switch port is turning off layer two switching. It would disable VLANs and it would activate layer three. 
And then, of course, since it's layer three, we'll have to give the port an IP address. In summary, then, Ethernet is the most widely used LAN technology used today. Ethernet standards define both the layer two and the layer one. The Ethernet frame structure adds headers and trailers around the layer three PDU. Let's talk about PDU. That stands for protocol data unit. And really, if you could replace, see where it says layer three PDU, the layer three PDU is packet. And that's what PDU means. It means whatever the protocol of the layer is. And so we could rewrite or re-say this one. The Ethernet frame structure adds headers and trailers around the packet to encapsulate the message being sent. They use PDU on exams a lot, so they're testing whether you know that the layer three PDU is a packet. If I said layer two PDU, you would say frame. If I said layer four PDU, you would say segment. That's what they mean with PDU. As an implementation of the IEEE 802 and 8023 standards, the Ethernet frame provides MAC addressing and air checking, which is that CRC or frame check sequence. And we've been able to replace hubs with switches in the network, which has increased performance and bandwidth um, by giving us full duplex links. Layer 2 addressing provided by Ethernet, the MAC address, supports unicast, multicast, and broadcast communications. Ethernet uses the ARP protocol to find the right MAC address for a corresponding and known IP address. And each node, a node is a PC, a printer, a phone, any device, a switch, a router, any device on an IP network has both a MAC address and an Ethernet address. The ARP protocol resolves IPv4 addresses. It's kind of redundant. They talked about that. The layer two switch builds a MAC address table, right? And that's called the CAM table or MAC address table that keeps track of each port on the switch and what MAC addresses are assigned to that port. And sometimes there's more than one MAC address on a single port. Uh, in the case of connected to a wireless access point or connected to another switch, you're going to have all the MAC addresses from that switch on your switch port. Layer 3 switches are also capable of performing Layer 3 routing functions. So they have a mini-me router built in. They also uh, typically work a little faster than a standalone router um, because we've removed some of the routing capability and it's also built in. Thank you for your time. This is a long chapter, a lot of reading ahead, and uh, we'll see you in class.